right, time for more One and Only Ivan. We're on page 56, The Beetle. Mac gives me a new black crayon and a fresh pile of paper. It's time to work again. I smell the crayon, roll it in my hands, press the sharp point against my palm. There's nothing I love more than a new crayon. I search my domain for something to draw. What is black? An old banana pill would work, but I've eaten them all. Knot tag is brown. My little pool is blue. The yogurt raisin I'm saving for this afternoon is white, at least on the outside. Something moves in the corner. I have a visitor. A shiny beetle has stopped by. Bugs often wander through my domain on their way to somewhere else. Hello, beetle, I say. He freezes, silent. Bugs never want to chat. The beetle's an attractive bug with a body like a glossy nut. He's black as a starless night. That's it. I'll draw him. It's hard making a picture of something new. I don't get that chance very often. But I try. I look at the beetle who's being kind enough to not to move and then back at my paper. I draw his body, his legs, his little antenna, his sour expression. I'm lucky the beetle stays all day. Usually bugs don't linger when they visit. I'm beginning to wonder if he's feeling all right. Bob, who's been known to munch on bugs from time to time, offers to eat him. I tell Bob that won't be necessary. When I'm finishing my last picture, when, oh, I'm finishing my last picture when Mac returns. George and Julia are with him. Mac enters my domain and picks up a drawing. What the heck is this, he asks. Beats me what Ivan thinks he's drawing. This is a picture of nothing, a big black nothing. Julia's standing outside my domain. Can I see, she asks. Mac holds my picture up to the window. Julia tilts her head. She squeezes one eye shut. Then she opens her eye and scans my domain. I know, she exclaimed. It's a beetle. See that beetle over by Ivan's pool? Man, I just sprayed this place for bugs. Mac walks over to the beetle and lifts his foot. Before Mac can stomp, the beetle skitters away, disappearing through a crack in the wall. Mac turns back to my drawings. So, you figure this is a beetle, huh? If you say so, kid. Oh, that's a beetle for sure, Julia says, smiling at me. I know a beetle when I see one. It's nice. I think having a fellow artist around. And here's, I don't think this is Ivan's drawing. I think that's an actual picture of the beetle. It's a big beetle. Page 60, change. Stella is the first to notice the change, but soon we all feel it. A new animal is coming to the Big Top Mall. How do we know? Because we listen. We watch and most of all, we sniff the air. Humans always smell odd when change is in the air, like rotten meat with a hint of papaya. Bob fears our our new neighbor will be a giant cat with slitted eyes and a coiled tail. But Stella says a trunk will arrive this afternoon carrying a baby elephant. How do you know, I ask. I sample the air, but all I smell is caramel corn. I love caramel corn. I can hear her, Stella says. She's crying for her mother. I listen. I hear the cars charging past. I hear the snore of the sun bears in their wire domain but I don't hear any elephants. You're just hoping, I say. Stella closes her eyes. No, she says softly, not hoping, not at all. My TV is off, so for a while we wait for the new neighbor. I ask Stella to tell us a story. Stella rubs her right front foot against the wall. Her foot is swollen again, an ugly deep red. If you're not feeling well, Stella, I say, you could take a nap and tell us a story later. I'm fine, she says, and she carefully shifts her weight. Tell us the Jambo story, I say. It's a favorite of mine, but I don't think Bob has ever heard it. Because she remembers everything, Stella knows many stories. I like colorful tales with black beginnings and stormy middles and cloudless blue sky endings, but any story will do. I'm not in a position to be picky. Once upon a time, Stella begins, there was a human boy. He was visiting a gorilla family at a place called the zoo. 
What's a zoo? Bob asks. He's a street smart dog, but there's much he hasn't seen. A good zoo, Stella says, is a large domain, a wild cage, a safe place to be. It has room to roam and humans who don't hurt. She pauses, considering her words. A good zoo is how humans make amends. Stella moves a bit, groaning softly. The boy stood on a wall, she continues, watching, pointing, but he lost his balance and fell into a wild cage. Humans are clumsy, I interrupt. If only they would knuckle walk, they wouldn't topple so often. Stella nods. Good point, Ivan. In any case, the boy lay in a motionless heap while the humans gasped and cried. The silverback, whose name was Jambo, examined the boy as was his duty while his troop watched from a safe distance. Jambo stroked the child gently. He smelled the boy's pain and then he stood watch. When the boy awoke, his humans cried out, stay still, don't move, because they were certain, humans are always certain about things, that Jambo would crush the boy's life from him. The boy moaned and the crowd waited, hushed, expecting the worst. Jambo led his troop away. Men came down on ropes and whisked the child to waiting arms. Was the boy all right? Bob asked. He wasn't hurt, Stella says, although I wouldn't be surprised if his parents hugged him so many times that night in between their scoldings. Bob, who was chewing his tail, pauses, tilting his head. Is that a true story? I always tell the truth, Stella replies, although sometimes I confuse the facts. Page 67, Lucky. I've heard the Jambo story many times. Stella says that humans found it odd that the huge silverback didn't kill the boy. Why, I wonder, was that so surprising? The boy was young, scared, and alone. He was, after all, just another ape. Bob nudges me with his cold nose. Ivan, he says, why aren't you and Stella in a zoo? I look at Stella, and she looks at me, and she smiles sadly with her eyes just a little, the way only elephants can do. Just lucky, I guess, she says. And that's where we're going to stop.